Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Paki, and on behalf of uh, Dr. Pramod Jaswal, Research Director NIICE, I welcome you all to an exclusive session by Professor Robert Jervis on foreign policy of the US, brought to you by the Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement. NIICE is an independent, apolitical, and nonpartisan think tank whose belief lies in freedom, democracy, and a world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. And all these webinars are just a step forward to make this vision turn into a reality. Talking about today's session, our esteemed guest for the day is Professor Robert Jervis. He is the Altai E. Stevenson Professor of International Politics and has been a member of the Columbia Political Science Department since 1980. He has also held professional appointments at, at the University of California at Los Angeles and Harvard University. He served as president of the American Political Science Association from the year 2000 till 2001. Professor Jervis is co-editor of the Cornell Studies in Security Affairs, a series published by Cornell University Press and a member of numerous editorial review boards for scholarly journals. His publications include Perception and Misperception in International Politics, The Meaning of the Nuclear Revolution, System Effects, Complexity in Political and Social Life, American Foreign Policy in a New Era, and Why Intelligence Fails. Lessons from the Fall of Shah and Iraqi Community, <coughs> and several edited volumes and numerous articles in scholarly journals. His latest book is How Statesmen Think, the Psychology of International Politics. Welcome, sir. We are obliged to have you today with us. Before I hand over the floor to you, I would like to inform our audience that this session is being streamed live on our Facebook channel as well. So please feel free to like, share, and comment. In addition to it, we as organizers expect you to put forward your questions in the Zoom chat box or our Facebook Live for Professor Robert to answer during the end of the session. In the question answer session, we'll try to incorporate as many questions as we can. On this note, I now hand over the floor to Professor Robert for the next 35 or 40 minutes. So the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I have to say at the beginning when I told the organizers that I have a bad cough. It's not COVID, and even if it were, I couldn't infect you, but it means I may break out coughing, take water, but uh, <coughs> just please bear with me. It's a real pleasure here. I've never actually been to Nepal, but my brother, who I'm very close with, spent several years as a a Fulbright Exchange professor in, uh, in Kathmandu. He also is a mountain climber and has not done the highest mountains, but it's a lot of trekking. So uh, through him, I, uh, and he has a lot of Nepali friends who I've met. So uh, it's a special pleasure to join you. My talk is going to be in three sections. The first is where we've come from. That is a little background on to a traditional American foreign policy. Second is where we are, meaning the foreign policy of the Trump administration. And that will take a little more time. The third where we will be in the future this is premised on uh, Biden being elected president. I think the odds are very, very much in favor of that. Uh, the poll, uh, polls are now trending more for Biden than they trended for Hillary Clinton four years ago, although all of us are aware of what happened four years ago and of the fact that even if national polling data is pretty accurate, state by state may not. And also we're all aware of the slight but frightening dangers of post-election problems. 
But anyway, that is the assumption. All right, with that, where we've been. Um, America, of course, is a young country, as you know, a little more than 200 years old, even if you count a colonial heritage, 300 years. Um, so its traditions in some ways are not as deeply rooted as um, the, um, the countries many of you are from, but they still, I think, are important. It's often said that America's tradition in foreign policy is isolationist. Uh, every American school child is familiar with Washington's farewell address, where he warned about entangling alliances. And indeed, it's striking that uh, although today the conventional wisdom in political science is democracies keep their word, especially on the U.S. was born out of breaking a treaty. America's first treaty with, was fr with France, uh, and uh, the treaty committed both sides to a joint peace agreement with Britain. Well, the U.S. broke that and made a separate peace agreement with Britain. Um, I think the French have resented it ever since. And so, what, wrote, what Washington warned about was entangling alliances, but he didn't call for isolation. And although the U.S. was blessed by having large oceans on east and west and relatively weak countries to the north and south, it never was completely secure, even after the War of 1812 and British invaded and Washington, uh, but it was more secure than many of the countries, certainly in, in Europe and perhaps in Asia, but it always engaged in the world. It traded extensively, both with Europe and in a way even more with uh, Asia. Some of the old established American families made their fortunes trading with China. Uh, so the, the, it isn't so much isolation that characterizes the American political tradition as what we saw with the uh, peace treaty with Great Britain that ended the war, uh, and that is unilateralism, the U.S. acting on its own, not having binding alliances not paying nearly as much attention to what others were doing as many countries did. It's a luxury given by geography. And then by the turn of the 20th century, the fact of American economic power eventually turning into military power. That, that tradition of unilateralism is still very strong in the U.S. And to jump ahead in a minute, Trump's stress on unilateralism, although he doesn't use that word, is very, strikes a very responsive chord in most Americans. Why should we have to work in concert with others? Uh, a second aspect of the American foreign policy tradition or history is foreign policy is rarely central to the United States. As a somewhat, say, isolated country, domestic issues, including ethnic politics, which are not new with current concern about race and equity, go back to the founding, are very strong. Economic considerations, local. So foreign policy is literally foreign to the United States. Uh, and third, what George Kennan said, the marvelous American diplomat and really active writer about American foreign relations and, and America. He likened democracies in general, but the United States in particular, 
to a dinosaur. Now, this was the old image of dinosaurs in the 1950s. We now know they're very active creatures. They run around, they do all sorts of interesting things. But when Bannon was writing, they were considered very, very sluggish. And he said, that's what American democracy is like. It just pays very little attention to the <coughs> external environment until someone really whacks it on the tail or hits it on the head and gets it, somehow gets its attention. And then it thrashes about and almost you know, destroys everything in its sight. In other words, the US tends to participate either not much or maybe too much like the, the war in Iraq. Uh, Pennon was wrong on the dinosaurs, but I don't think he was wrong about the United States. Now you may say, but that's not the American foreign policy. I remember, you know, that's because most of us know about post-World War II foreign policy. What I want to say about that is that it is a tremendous exception to the American political tradition. Um, and it took great effort by the leaders, not only elected leaders, but uh, the media that was more united, industrial leaders, union leaders, union was much more, unions were much more powerful uh, uh, 70 years ago than they are now. And of course, it took the perceived threat from the Soviet Union and then after the Korean War from the People's Republic of China. It took all that to sort of produce the America you know, one that sees leadership for better or for worse, I'm not going to, to uh, be very active, to have alliances, or more alliances that didn't have an end date that were permanent alliances with Europe, just what uh, Washington had warned against, to then become very active in Asia after the Korean War, to support international institutions, to um, will throw its weight around for good and for bad. I'm not judging whether this helped others. Uh, the America we're familiar with in that sense is a radical break from tradition. The post-Cold War America, 40 years from since then, then it is a complicated period, partly of great optimism and then the war on terror and now some pessimism. And let me just not talk about that now. We'll come back in the question period. But I want to talk about we are now, that is the last four years, and the foreign policy of the Trump administration. <laughs> I have to say at the start, that I'm a lifelong Democrat with a capital D, and I never thought Trump could get nominated, never thought he could get elected, uh, because I thought he was inexperienced, impulsive, erratic, ignorant, and a terrible character. I still believe those things, but obviously misread the American public badly, as really most of us did. Uh, and I think his foreign policy has been weak, ineffective, erratic, and bullying. I, I say that for my, give my judgment, not to convince you of it, but to give you my bias of where I'm coming from. So I try to put my bias aside as an analyst of foreign policy. And now let me turn to trying to describe and explain the foreign policy. The most important thing about Trump's foreign policy is that it is not, it is not an it, it's a they. That is, there is no unified foreign policy. Not because the country is split, which it is, but because this administration is deeply, deeply not split, which implies two, you know, division into two, but fractured. Trump has never been able to exert discipline over the foreign policy 
uh, establishment and his own appointees. It's really been bizarre, but Mick Milvaney, his former acting chief of staff, who defends Trump still, uh, says Trump appoints badly. And whether you think well or badly of most of his foreign, foreign policy appointees, the big difference between them and most of his domestic policy people is the domestic cabinet secretaries he's appointed usually believe in his agenda and are trying to carry it out. The foreign policy people he's appointed, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and he's had multiple people uh, in defense, he's had two secretaries of state, uh, his national security advisors, almost more of them than I can count, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, who plays some role in foreign policy, and their top assistants. They do not believe fully in the Trump agenda. So if you look at American foreign policy or, and are confused, that's right. Don't do the thing of, oh, I'm confused. There must be a master plan behind this. If I can only find the key to the lock or the missing piece in the puzzle, it will make sense. It will not make sense. I just read this morning that Robert O'Brien, <coughs> the national security advisor, said that by early next year, American troops in Afghanistan would be drawn down to about 2,500. Now, first, this contradicts the position taken by our negotiating team led by my former colleague and still good friends, Al Khalil Zad, who I have enormous respect and affection for, and think he's doing an incredibly good job for the US, for Afghanistan, for the region, doing an incredible job of playing a very weak hand because Trump undercuts him. The official position of the US is that troop reductions beyond where we are now depends on conditions, conditions being progress toward a lowering of violence and a, a ceasefire in Afghanistan, progress toward an agreement between the Taliban and the Afghan government and the uh, negotiations going on in Doha. So what O'Brien says is we're going down to 2,500. That takes the card out of the American negotiator's hand and throws it away. So we're not united, but that's not all. According to the report I read, and I have not checked, but I can believe it, but as I say, I've not checked. Trump, after that, tweeted, no, no, all the troops will be gone by Christmas. Now, we can debate whether that's a good policy or a bad policy. My point is, there are three American policies on Afghanistan, not one. This is, this is as an, I'm, as an American citizen, I'm embarrassed. As a student of international politics, I'm chagrined. It reminds me of a saying some of you who know American sports might know. And Casey Stingle, who was a great uh, member of the New York Yankees and then went on to manage the Yankees and then manage the Mets. And he said lots of sort of strange things. When he joined the Mets, as they were an expansion baseball team, they were not good. He said, doesn't anyone here know how to play this game? I look at American foreign policy and I ask that. Now that's a great danger of academics, the professors like me, or students like many of you, to think that we're smarter than leaders, that we could do a better job than they. 
And when I was in college and graduate school, I thought that. And then I started meeting some of these people. And then for on my they're us. I mean, my students are not in this administration, but in the past three administrations, they've been high ranking officials. So they're us. You know, they know more than we know. Very dedicated, very confident. So uh, what we see in the disorganization, pulling across purposes, is very unusual. But in most issues, not all, and I'll come to that in a minute, that's the key. The key to American foreign, Trump's foreign policy is that there is no key to it. Um, now, the key maybe in some areas is Trump himself. Say I'm very deeply critical of him. What I'm going to say now is critical. I can defend it as an objective analysis, but realize that people who defend Trump would think I'm unfair. I think Trump, when he's active in foreign policy, his policy reflects his personality. He's driven, I believe, by a deep sense of personal grievance. The book by his niece, although of course have grievances or, um, to settle, is I think largely right. Trump had a terrible childhood uh, and was indoctrinated by his father into you know, always being tough and to having a tremendous sense of grievance. And you see everything when Trump talks it's driven by a sense of how great he is himself, which at that level, I think, is only disguising a deep personal insecurity, as anyone brought up in the Trump household would have had, uh, and a sense of grievance against the world. And that's a lot of his policy, is the US has been ripped off, taken advantage of by adversaries and allies alike. American, previous American leaders of both parties have been wimps. They've not stood up for America. And as a result, we've seen jobs leave the United States. We've seen America support adversaries with our hard earned money. America's been taken advantage of by world. We've been played for a sucker. Um, I think that's his view of the world. Now, I want to stress on one other thing. <coughs> John Bolton, whose book is quite interesting, and I think accurate in relaying the various episodes. Bolton says that Trump's policy is driven by nothing but the desire to get reelected. I think that's quite wrong and quite unfair. Um, I think the last couple of months it's been reelection. That's normal. Uh, no, Trump's foreign policy has been driven by this view of the world, which reflects his personality and being ripped off. Now, in two areas, his policy has been quite consistent. That um, these are the areas of trade and immigration. And when you go back and look at his record, not the books he wrote, because he did not write them, didn't even read them, but the interviews he's given over the past really 50 years. Uh, two British scholars went and did this, and I've drawn on their work. There are two consistent themes. 
trade, we get ripped off. We make bad tra trade deals. Uh, all countries, including India, and of course China, have always ripped us off. And, but this view is not you know, co uh, only contemporary. It's consistent with what he said since he became at all interested in foreign policy. And I think it's consistent with his foreign policy, his personality. <laughs> the other theme, I'll put a harsh label on it, and, and many would, for em immigration, is, well, is anti-immigration. Immigration's bad from the United States should be sharply limited. True for legal immigration, true for illegal immigration. I'll put a harsh label on this, which I know can be debated, uh, I think is accurate, and that is racism. It's immigration from non-white countries. Uh, I think Trump really is racist. That isn't to deny that he has some friends of color, not many, but some and uh, especially uh, personalities, celebrities from the entertainment and sports world. But I think everything we see indicates that his uh, political campaigning, which I think is obviously racist, is reflection of what he believes. But anyway, I think that is a judgment you can accept, you can reject, but I think what I can support, and the, the record is crystal clear, is that stopping immigration in the United States has always been a goal, and that is something he has followed consistently. This year, the U.S. is on track, I believe, to admit 10 or 12,000, maybe 15,000 refugees, which is about one-tenth of what we normally admit. And we also see his consistent attempt to clamp down on illegal immigration, to do more deporting, although some of you may know, uh, uh, President Barack Obama deported more illegal immigrants than Trump has, but Trump has trumpeted the deportations and his clamping down at the border. And we now have recent documents that confirm that the policy of separating parents from young children was uh, official policy from the highest level. It was not an accident. So in that and in the attempt to make trade deals that he, first of all, are bilateral rather than multilateral. And second, do what Trump thinks are bringing jobs back to the US, even if most economists think they're not. That and stopping immigration. That's consistent. But the rest of the world, it isn't. The policy toward China is really very strange. Starts with it, one thread that is consistent with Trump is that he cares about personal relations. Many leaders think that they are the key to their country's foreign policy and that the relations they establish with others are the key. They great, they have, uh, place a very high estimate on their personal ability to understand other leaders, to make connections with other leaders, to manipulate other leaders. Trump has that in spades, partly because of his business background. But what he also has is an affinity for authoritarians. He likes strong men, and yes, they're all men. Uh, Putin, uh, Xi Jinping, obviously, uh, Erdogan, 
some of his attraction to Modi, as Modi's, uh, well, you call authoritarian if you don't like it, strong leadership if you do, I call it authoritarianism. So he feels he can work with those people. So he started out with this as the pillar of the China policy. Uh, but also, oh, to me, an affinity of strongman, I mean, the, what he calls his love affair with Kim Jong-un, the most brutal leader on the face of the earth, which is bizarre from the standpoint of American traditions, American values, and, and from common sense. Um, so with China, though Trump has concentrated first on the personal relations, second on trade deals. Most people in the American establishment who look at China are concerned about China, but not about the bilateral trade deficit, which actually is partly a quirk of the accounting rules. They're concerned with China's expansion into the South China Sea. They're concerned with the new wolf warrior Chinese diplomacy, which is they consider a threat. They worry about Chinese aggressiveness on the border with India. They look at those big strategic issues. That's not what Trump focuses on. So the China policy is just very odd. The Russia policy, you have to put air quotes around policy. What can you say? Trump refuses to admit that Russia interfered four years ago and it still interfered, refuses to condemn uh, Putin's authoritarianism, refuses to uh, back Ukraine in many ways. On the other hand, we did send some lethal weapons to Ukraine, although they're nowhere near the front lines. We did have economic sanctions. Uh, we've talked about others, um, but partly this is because the people under Trump are all anti-Russian. His first security advisor, General Flynn was not, but all the others from McMaster through O'Brien feel Russia is a menace. And that's true also for Secretary of State Pompeo. So how do we explain the Russia policy? It's because it's a they, not an it. And I say that as someone who would favor not a reset with Russia, who couldn't do that, favor a more policy of moderation and attempt at conciliation with Russia. Um, all right, let me take five, 10 more minutes. Where we'll be, obviously my crystal ball is uh, back in the shop for repairs. Uh, what I'm gonna say is based on the assumption that Joe Biden's elected president, it's very likely. Um, that there are two big pitfalls. Well, you will face first a very difficult world. Uh, a number of my students will go into the Biden administration at high level. They're marvelous. Uh, I hope when we travel, I'll go down to Washington and get some inside dope and whisper in their ears, but I don't envy them. It's a very difficult situation they'll inherit. There are two, uh, my wife is bringing me tea with honey for my cough. Are you coughing? Yes, I am. Um, I've written a little about the situation he'll face in an article in the American Journal, Political Science Quarterly, uh, the summer issue, 
And if your universities have site licenses, you can get it. Uh, uh, if you can and want it, send me an email and I think I have the PDF or can get it. Anyway, there are two obvious pitfalls. One is to think you can go back to January 1st, uh, 2017. That is, these are the people Biden will have, all were in the Obama administration. And one danger is they think they can just pick up where they left off. They can't, it's a different world. Partly, the trust in the US is much lower. Trump has taught people called IR 101 that we live in a world without a world government and countries, uh, there's nothing that can bind countries. Nothing that can bind other countries, nothing that binds countries themselves. So for during the Cold War and the post-Cold War era, there was a degree of continuity and everyone assumed the US would continue and that one administration would more or less follow the promises of others. Well, Trump broke all that. And that's like the saying, a bell once rung can't be unrung. <clears throat> so that's a difficult world. So the temptation to say, forget the last four years. Let's pick up where we left off. Temptation, I think, is very strong. Another temptation is anything but Trump. Every new administration comes in with scorn for what its predecessor did. True, even when George Bush Sr. took over from Reagan and he'd been vice president, there was a tremendous changes in America and Bali. So every leader feels they should do something different. The Bush Jr. administration was infamous for its policy of A, B, C, anything but Clinton. If Clinton did it, let's do something different. The A, B, T, anything but Trump impulse will be very, very strong, but a mistake. A political danger is looking weak. Trump's policy, you could say, looked at objectively, really is weak. We haven't made any good deals. Relations with Iran, relations with China are much worse than they were four years ago. China has built up its military strength in East South China Sea more. China is more assertive of the India. Iran is much closer to a nuclear weapon than it was four years ago. Uh, American standing in the world is lower. So you could say as an objective student of international politics, America is much weaker than four years ago. You know, I have to, I'd agree with that. But the point is, in domestic politics, Trump's bluff and bluster, he's been tough tough with Iran, told other countries, especially allies, they have to do more, push things around. So for Biden to have a reasonable policy, he will be immediately attacked domestically as he's weak, he's a wimp. Let me tell you, if Trump is defeated, and I think he will be, Trumpism in the U.S. is not going away. And if he recovers completely from COVID, Donald Trump himself is not going away. He is not, <clears throat> Trump and Trumpism and the Republicans are not going to have a, called a honeymoon period with the Biden administration. They will attack. So let me just say two more minutes and then I'll stop. There are cha enormous challenges. Getting back into some deal with Iran. Um, 
that Iran has said, no, you can't just pick up where you left off. You immediately have to remove all the sanctions and even give us reparations. Well, that's not going to happen. So getting back into something like the JCPOA, very difficult. Now, I think I know some of the people who will be involved in that. Uh, they're very skilled. They're very sophisticated. Uh, if anyone can do it, they can do it, and Biden will care. But it's very, very difficult. Policy toward China, charting a course that is firm where we need to be without being needlessly, uh, recklessly antagonistic. Don't give me that assignment. Rebuilding with allies. <coughs> A lot easier, <laughs> but Trump is right. Europe is not paying its full fair share of defensive of Europe. If the Europeans feel there's a real menace from Russia, they should pay more. He's right. So he's going to be faced with that. Plus the fact that Biden will have this much time to deal with foreign policy. When he comes in, he will inherit a raging pandemic. Um, he probably will have a vaccine. It's not fully known. I mean, it will pass FDA, but you know, still with lots of question marks and many people not wanting to take it and probably limited efficacy. So I'm saying that the vaccine is not going to make COVID go away. You'll face the fact that the world still has a COVID pandemic. And as an internationalist, he's pledged to trying to share some vaccine with our allies and friends. Well, there are real limited capacity to produce the vaccine and to produce the glass uh, containers needed for it. That's about a real bottleneck. So anyway, but he'll face domestically the pandemic. He'll face an economy that is not fully recovering. Even if uh, before the election, there's an agreement on so-called phase four <coughs> support for the economy, it will not be fully robust. And his, what I say, he'll have this much time for foreign policy because this much, you know, 23 hours of his day are going to have to be spent on economy, COVID, issues of racial justice, um, the environment where he has to reverse all of Trump's policies. So the amount of time he'll have on foreign policy is not enormous. And this is the final challenge. In closing, and I do want to close it, for Biden and for, again, the American tradition, many people in the US say that the US is unique. And when they say American exceptionalism, when they say that, they mean it in a very, way very complimentary to the US. We are uniquely disinterested, that is, we don't have interests abroad. We help others, you know, all sorts of good things. Um, Trump, to his credit, says, no, that's not right. We've killed people abroad, we've done awful things. Most Americans still believe in American exceptionalism. And when Obama more gently tried to discourage that, he got great pushback domestically. Some critics, on the other hand, both domestic leftists and abroad, think that America is unique, but uniquely evil or uniquely aggressive. And they point to the Vietnam War, some of you from the region, would point to the Kissinger-Nixon policy in the uh, um, 
Bangladesh in 1971. People in South America would talk about Guatemala and Chile. And those people say America is unique maybe because of its capitalist system or its a genocidal a, a culture coming out of its birth and uh, displacing the indigenous population. They see America as unique too, but bad. I think both those views are wrong. Yes, there are unusual things about the US that I talked about, but as a realist with a capital R, I think that all countries <coughs> behave badly. All countries put their own interests first. They sometimes do good in the world, but I wouldn't count on it. All countries are short-sighted and blunder. So I think uh, the view of American exceptionalism held by many people in the US who defend it, and many of its severest critics are both wrong. But in any case, America and the world face real challenges. And I'm glad to see many people, young people, and at my age, I find a lot of people are young, deeply involved <laughs> in studying these issues and perhaps playing a role because we need all the help we can get. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for such an insightful letter. I tried to summarize it. Uh, I couldn't do it completely because that was uh, th that covered so many points, but still uh, giving it a try. You very well gave, gave an overview of the US foreign policy from the past to the present. You declared the Trump's foreign policy uh, driven by the desire to get elected. You discussed the ripping of the US where the policy remained consistent under, under Trump's tenure, bad trade, immigration, and how America was being played uh, this entire time by the rest of the world. Uh, policy towards China, you declared it strange the concentration of Trump on personal interventions. You also talked about the two major pitfalls based on assumptions, one of them being uh, to think that we can actually go back to January 2017. Uh, and going towards the end, you threw light on the challenges, one of them being dealing with Iran. And, and your focal point uh, was set on COVID-19, issues of racial justice, environment, economy, and how is the US unique? And at the end, uh, you clearly stated that it's not just US who has done bad in this world. Every country does something or the other bad. After all, it's a very realistic world. So uh, it was a very, very good session, sir. It was very good to hear you out. And now we proceed towards the question and answer session. The first question that has been put forward in the Zoom chat room is um, American foreign policy since World War II has been driven by its interest to secure its hegemony and influence as the world's most powerful state. Do you think if the Democrats return to power in 2021, would we see a return of benefic multilateralism in the US foreign policy? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a very important question. Looking back, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think the United States was entirely hegemonic. There's a big debate in the academic community about that, and, and I room for a lot of judgment and continuing historical research. Hegemonic to me calls up perhaps a more consistency and a more willingness to uh, pay a high price to maintain great American influence around the world. I think we had even in the Cold War. I think uh, the US policy, though certainly has been to try to keep significant influence everywhere and the real, I won't say genius, of the President Truman, Secretary of State Atchison, 
those around them, and many of people in the American foreign policy elite and society was to do this multilaterally. And as I say, that's an incredible American tradition. Now, if you're a critic, you can say this is multilateralism in name only, that the US never ceded any power to anyone else. Um, that multilateralism was the glove disguising the fist of American economic and political power. I think that is not entirely wrong, but I think it is exaggerated. The US in the Cold War supported the economic um, reconstruction of Japan and Europe in a way that made those countries very strenuous economic competitors of the US. Um, so, and we rebuild again, take East Asia, Japan, able to follow, follow more independent of the US than we would like in some areas. Um, I think Biden would like to return to what is you called it a benign hegemony. He certainly would want to cooperate more with allies in Europe and Asia. He will, at minimum, <laughs> treat them with the respect <laughs> that they deserve and that Trump did not show. You've all seen the picture of I think it was a G20 meeting where they were po ready to pose for the big picture, which always has the American president front and center. And Trump came late as usual and literally pushed his way to the front. Biden will not do things like that, literally, figuratively. Um, now, how he will handle real differences with allies. Germany does not want to pay more for defense. It's carrying a large burden of dealing with a million refugees that uh, Merkel, I think very altruistically and bravely admitted but three, how many, four years ago. So, you know, what this will consist of is not entirely clear. I think Biden, partly because of the pressing domestic issues, would be happy to delegate more power and to say, to say that especially the Europeans, if you people of Europe, the EU, can get a common foreign policy toward Russia, we will support that. I mean, within limits, but we'll be glad to have you take the lead. In Asia, of course, situation isn't that way. There <clears throat> is no strong multilateral group. China is much stronger than Russia. Japan is not a Germany. Uh, the <clears throat> Bush administration started and uh, the Trump administration has continued an attempt to build the quad that is especially bringing India in. I think Trump will, Biden will support that. Those countries, even if they do work together a bit more, are nowhere near being as unified as Europe, and Europe is not very unified. So the multilateralism will be difficult politically. And then finally, he'll try for more multilateralism economically. He certainly will reinvigorate the WTO. Uh, whether he'll go back to the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and rejoin, he knows it's the right thing to do. Uh, and it would matter, I think, symbolically to the region. 
but domestically it will be difficult. But you may be able to craft it, you know, get some things, small changes, call it, can't call it the TPP, I don't know what you call it, uh, and do that. So I think we'll make efforts along those lines. Please report to the next one. Yes, thank you. Um, so how do you look at Russia in the future of US-China competition? And if China grows more, more powerful, can we have a shift in Russia's policy towards China? Um, well, it's very interesting. In the Cold War, of course, after 1971, we had a triangle of Russia and the Soviet Union, PRC, uh, US triangle. And the US more or less was able to be the, if you will, the, the pivot or the uh, apex because China and Russia had a great deal of hostility. And so uh, we were gave, got the benefit of that. Now, uh, it appears as though American, Sino-American hostility or tension, how much um, can it be not clear? I don't think it will be a new Cold War, but I'm going to depend on that. But certainly Sino-American tension and hostility is a central axis. Russia, as we know, is much weaker. The conflict between Russia and the US conflicts are real, but much more limited. Uh, Russia has been, and China have been in a alignment, not an alliance, but an alignment. Putin and me have met what is it, 20, 30, 40 times, enormous number of personal meetings between the two. There's some institutional links. There may well, there, there's some military trade. There may well be military cooperation that is secret. That Russia and China have uh, expertise in different aspects of cutting technologies. And it may well be that Russia is helping China in, for instance, making its submarines very quiet so we can elude American detection. And China may be helping Russia in things like AI. We don't know that. I think an objective American and should be to limit that uh, alignment and with skill to play on the fact that there are important conflicts of interest. I mean, Russia cannot be happy sharing a border with the most rapidly growing country in the world. China, although has not talked about this recently, still hasn't, uh, you know, still refers to these as the unequal treaties where China lost an enormous amount of territory. There's a very heavy Chinese population across the border. China and Russia are in rivalry for influence in the Central Asian republics. Plus the fact that uh, Russia is a deeply racist society. And I believe Putin probably is as well. Their view of the Chinese, uh, you know, getting a few glasses of vodka, uh, comes out. And China, of course, has the view that superiority of the Chinese civilization and that the Russians are barbarians. So, you know, there's opportunity here. So again, whether you can, the US could easily overplay its hand and 
But I do think an objective of the Biden administration will be to try to return to the U.S. being the uh, um, the top corner of the triangle, so to speak. Can we take the next question? Yes, I'll take forward. Uh, the next question is, how can the USA counter the continuous rise of China in the international arena? Is it the end of USA's unipolarity? Um, yes. Um, you say Sino-American relations is probably the leading question for American foreign policy. Well, I have to pause one second and say, if you ask me what's the leading threat to American security, I'd say American domestic problems and climate change. Uh, and the latter is very important internationally. Putting that aside, the conventional threats is certainly the greatest. Um, but judging how great is the Chinese threat? What are the Chinese intentions? What will China do if it grows stronger? I say if, because China has enormous domestic economic problems, social, political, economic. Um, this is a, a fundamental puzzle. I, I teach my under an undergraduate class this semester on the international politics of the Cold War. And we spent the last two weeks on the origins of the Cold War and what led the US to see the Soviet Union as a threat. In fact, the whole question of threat perception, which is central to international politics. So we start with anarchy, security, what leads countries to see situations as threatening, other countries as threatening, is really relatively unexplored territory. It's embarrassing for me <laughs> as a student of the field to say that. I've written a little, but very little about it. Um, so I think it's an open question as to the threat of China. I think what the Trump administration has said in the last year is greatly exaggerated. I know there are a series of speeches by uh, the head of the FBI about the Chinese threat to us domestically in terms of spying, a uh, speech by O'Brien, speech by Pompeo, and the American language of saying, uh, referring not to the PRC, but to the CCP, that is the Chinese Communist Party, or the Communist Party of China, that to, to say that our adversary is the Chinese regime, not the Chinese people. On the one hand, that's fine. On the other hand, it says, oh, we're trying to overthrow the Chinese regime. Well, I would love to overthrow the Chinese regime. Just tell me how to do it and I'll sign on. If you can't tell me how to do it, please don't tell China that's what we're trying to do. I don't think that's the way to manage relations with China. Um, so uh, China is, a, is a, a threat, but I don't think it's, you say, 10 feet tall. I don't think it has the power a lot of the American hawks are projecting on China. The US has to decide what are the really vital interests. And I think it has to, in some areas, make concessions to China. It is, again, as a student of international politics, let me ask you and your students of this, under what theory of international politics would we find a country that had in previous centuries been very strong and powerful, then had a century of humiliation and weakness, and now has regained a significant amount of its strength? 
under what theory of IR would that, that not lead to some recalibration of its influence in the area? The <laughs> <laughs> I am not suggesting that the U.S. abandon its allies in Japan, its semi-alliance with Taiwan, its ties to India, but I'm saying <laughs> there can be a reasonable recalibration of what the US does toward China. I'm not sure we have to sail as many ships as we do as close to the Chinese shore. I think we do have to sail in the East and South China Sea. But as students of IR, we have to say, as power balances change, relations will change in some way in some way that is where the challenge for the Biden administration comes in. In principle, I think this can be managed. I do not think there are conflicts of interest between the US and China so great as to consider as to make war incredibly destructive or even a full quote decoupling, which would be economically incredibly destructive. I don't think those are inevitable, but I do think the new policy of a greater balance is difficult to craft. If I had a, a paper written down telling you how to do it, I'd give it to you, I don't. Can you take the next question? Yes, sir. sure. So coming to the next question, if becomes dependent, would there be a substantial lack of policies initiated by the Trump government? If yes, which policies and what do you think will uh, be the effect on foreign relations? Uh, let me, hold on. I think it's better if I can. Um, yeah. Well, I think the major shift will be in tone the bullying belligerence that we see in Trump will be replaced by diplomatic dialogue, a willingness to listen and hear, to take others' interests into account. And of course, other countries, I think even China, um, <clears throat> and whether China wants Trump or Biden can believe of them that they prefer dealing with Trump, but I think they'll probably see it as 60, 40. But most <clears throat> every country in the world, other than China and Netanyahu in Israel, will welcome a Biden administration. And so we'll want to cooperate with Biden, we want to meet the Biden administration uh, halfway. And I think in diplomacy tone matters. <clears throat> Countries will see the possibilities for agreements. And certainly Biden will rejoin the Paris climate change accord. I think he'd do that with a stroke of the pen. <clears throat> um, and he'll do that. And that will mean, I think, a great deal to leaders and uh, the public around the world. He will commit to doing America's share on reducing carbon emissions, which is very difficult. I think that will be a change people will notice. He'll commit to much more cooperation. He'll commit to strengthening, not weakening, the World Health Organization. Uh, <clears throat> he'll work to try to get 
<laughs> the vaccines as widespread as possible in other countries. All that matters. Uh, he certainly will try to come, come back to an agreement with Iran. Iran is now fairly quiet. I think Iran consciously believes that if they are provocative, it will help Trump. And so in a way they've been less assertive than I would expected over, since the summer. But when the other side of the coin is, they think that uh, Biden is committed to coming back to JCPOA means they think they are in a very strong bargaining position. They expect major concession, concessions from Biden, quite probably more concessions than he can give. So Biden would like a major change, but it isn't clear he can do one. Also, Iranian domestic politics is very complex and they're heading into a presidential election in the spring of 2021. Um, Johnny and Zarif, on one hand, might see some advantage to a quick deal with the U.S., but it has to be a deal where they can bring home the bacon. It has to be a deal where they can really point to economic benefit. I don't know if Biden can do that. So if they can't do something quick, it's going to await the presidential election. And that will matter. Now, the supreme leader is the supreme leader. And he won't change, although he's going to die. He's very, you know, he's as old as I am and a lot sicker than I am. And it's amazing he's still alive. But as long as he is alive, he is the supreme leader. So whoever president, it matters, but not enormously, but it does matter some. And it'll take a while for a new president of Iran to get ready. So a lot of things will be up in the air. And if Iran continues to enrich uranium, and it will, and if it, it in, develop, installs the new generation of, rea of centrifuges, situation in Iran can get difficult. And I might add, there's a real danger here. If Trump is defeated, uh, the period between November and January, it's one in which Israel might, or Netanyahu, not Israel's the country, Netanyahu might believe I'm going to sell out he thinks is the Israeli interest and be too soft. That the only hope to end what Netanyahu, I think, may sincerely believe is a mortal threat to Iran, to Israel's existence, not security, but existence. The only chance is to launch a strike against the Iranian nuclear facilities while Trump is in power. Uh, do I predict this in the sense of greater than 50-50 chance? No. But do I think this is a very, very real chance? Yes. Um, anyway, so I think um, the change in tone will be greater. The change in substantive policies will be there, uh, but it's a slow and difficult path. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot for the answer. And now uh, let's talk a little about Afghanistan. Uh, which shift in the US foreign policy distinguishes President Trump with President Obama in the case of Afghanistan? Oh, you know, it's a good question. In Afghanistan, Relatively little, <laughs> except again, the incompetence and bluff and bluster. Obama, as you know, 
greatly increased the American troop strength in Afghanistan. Went up to what, over 100,000. And then with also what, another 20, 30,000 from allies. I don't think this really reflected strong conviction. When Obama campaigned, campaigned strongly against the Bush policy in the greater Middle East, that was from Israel all the way to Afghanistan, and especially in Iraq. But he couldn't look weak on national security. So Obama said, Iraq is the wrong war, the bad war. He had to say Afghanistan is the good war. Now, uh, I think Obama is, was basically a good president, a graduate of Columbia, political science major, so he was well educated, and say my friends advised him. But he didn't know anything about Afghanistan. He said Afghanistan's a good war to help get elected. He can't reverse on a dime. The military traps him by first coming with a, a you know, saying, okay, we need 25,000 more troops and then saying, whoops, we really need to go up to 100,000. You know, he says, well, he, he's forced to do it through domestic politics. He does it, but he does it by saying, we're only gonna be there, what, a year? He puts the withdrawal schedule in the same time he puts the, when the troops are going in. This isn't serious. And counterinsurgency was never going to work in Afghanistan. He always wanted first to enter into peace with Taliban. Uh, he worked on getting peace talks with, uh, with the Taliban very early. The record on this is still a secret. Uh, eventually it will come out. We'll see how many efforts he made to that, what he was willing to do. For various reasons, it never succeeded. But uh, he did, to me, what Trump did was what Obama wanted to do. How Obama would play an end game. <laughs> and by the way, Obama, uh, Trump's policy is identical to, Obama, to Biden's in the policy reviews in the first year of the Obama administration, um, Biden argued for counterterrorism, not counterinsurgency. Small group aimed at uh, Al Qaeda and then later would become ISIS, not nation building. It's exactly what Trump uh, then favored. So I think uh, the difference between the two is a pace and again in the, in the rhetoric. And I don't think Obama would undercut his negotiators the way a Trump does. Um, I think uh, Dr. Khalil Zad could do would much prefer working for Obama in this situation than Trump, although he could not say that. But yes, you're right, there's much more continuity there than one might believe by reading rhetoric on either side. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving to the last question for the day. What are the chances of the US shifting to post COVID-19? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. What are the chances of? The US shifting to self-reliance post COVID-19. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I do think the answer, I think, is yes and no. Yes, in that there's now much more attention to the supply chain. Um, how much? We're dependent on China in some areas, how much we're dependent on India in many areas, especially generic medications. 
and of course supply chain and microelectronics. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, what we have here, my computer couldn't function without a worldwide supply chain. So there will be more to get back up, bring some things home. Also, Biden has announced a Buy American plan. I put quotes around plan because it didn't push down, which, by the way, I think violates WTO rules and uh, is, uh, goes against multilateralism and will horrify our allies. Uh, but I think he'll, he'll try to do that, but in a limited way. I think he and the people around him, and a lot depends, I want to digress for one minute, a lot depends who will be a secretary of state, who will be a security advisor. We know the names of his inner circle, but there are more names than there are positions. And there are differences, but we don't know. But, uh, and they're important because as I say, he will have to negate an enormous amount to them, given the dealing with COVID, issues of race and equity and the dealing with the economy. Um, so, but I think Biden's instincts are multilateral. He will not try to be autarkic, that is America, as self-sufficient. Even in the energy area, Trump touts America as energy independent. This is not true for anyone who understands world oil markets. The US and Europe and Asia are tied together economically. And as long as Europe and Asia were dependent on oil from the Middle East, the US economy is dependent on that, even if it isn't direct. Biden understands that. And so to look at key areas, I hope, and say, uh, we don't want to be dependent on one country. Uh, and to take the case of India, we don't want to get all our generic medications <coughs> from India, even if our relations with India are very good. There are too many things could go wrong. So we'll want to diversify, want to bring some stuff home, build backup capacity, maybe diversify around the world. But I think that shouldn't be confused with autarky and saying, uh, building a fortress America, America alone for itself. No, I, I'm confident tr uh, Biden will not fall into that tr trap. If Trump is reelected, I'm not sure what he will do. I don't, I, think, I don't think Trump has a clue. But no, I, I think Biden's multilateralism runs uh, very deeply in his veins. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, with this, we have come to the end of the session. First of all, I would like to express our sincere thanks to Professor Robert Chovisa for agreeing to be a part of our guest lecture series. We would also like to thank uh, our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. I also must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience who participated in this webinar enthusiastically and those who are watching this live on our Facebook channel. Thank you so much for your valuable time and attention and for making this session a productive with your questions. We're truly honored to have you all with us. We hope to stay connected in future as well. It's really been a pleasure. And at last, I'd uh, like to thank Dr. Pramod Jaiswal for giving me the required amount of support and encouragement to moderate the session. It's been a worthwhile experience. Thank you so much. Thank